Gospodže i gospodo, dragi prijatelji, u ime Foruma za vanjsku politiku želim vam dobrodošlicu na ovu našu malu konferenciju o britanskoj politici prema Zapadnom Balkanu u svijetlu rata u Ukrajini. Posebno mi je zadovoljstvo pozdraviti i poželjeti dobrodošlicu našem posebnom gostu, Sir Stuart Upiću, specijalnom izoslaniku britanskog premijera za pitanja Zapadnog Balkana. Naročito pozdravljam veleposlanike i predstavnike veleposlanstava akreditiranih u Republici Hrvatskoj koji su prisutni bilo ovdje u dvorani ili u online prostoru. Srdečnu dobrodošlicu želim i svim panelistima, naročito onima koji, su sad, koji sada prvi puta govore na nekom događaju foruma, eh, doktoru Jasminu Haseću koji je doputovao iz Sarajeva da bi bio s nama, profesoru Ivanu Grdešiću, dekanu Fakulteta za međunarodne odnose na učilištu Libertas i doktoru Dauru Bobanu, profesor na Fakultetu političke znanosti. Ostali panelisti su članove foruma, tako da e, govorim jed, barem jednom u njihovo ime također. Naša se konferencija prati preko YouTube i Facebook kanala u livestream prijenosu, te stoga pozdravljam naše gledatelje preko tih medija. Za vas koji ste u dvorani, omogućen je simultani prijevod na engleski jezik, i naravno s engleskog na hrvatski. I konferencija će biti u potpunosti dvojezična, s tim što će prvi panel biti vođen na engleskom jeziku, a drugi na hrvatskom. Kada smo planirali naš program za ovu godinu, htjeli smo jedan od naših događaja fokusirati na pitanje britanske vanjske politike, smatrajući da je ta tema važna i zanimljiva, naročito nakon što je Ujedinjeno kraljevstvo izašlo iz Europske unije. Zanimalo nas je kakva će biti britanska post-brexitovska vanjska politika. Pojmovi koji su se u međuvremenu pojavili, kao što su Europa izvan Europske unije i globalna Britanija, dovoljno su inspirativni, barem nama politolozima, da bismo ih primijetili i o njima htjeli ponešto čuti i ponešto reći. Trebao je to, dakle, biti događaj o suvremenoj britanskoj vanjskoj politici općenito. Kao što smo nedavno imali priliku razmatrati novu njemačku vanjsku politiku s našim gostom Manuelom Sarcinom, koji je u među vremenu postao njemački izoslanik za Zapadni Balkan, dakle, izravni kolega sa Rastujeta Pića. No, ruski napad na Ukrajinu prije sad već skoro mjesec dana stvorio je nove okolnosti u kojima se i budućnost Europe i budućnost Zapadnog Balkana, kao i vanjske politike mnogih zemalja, nalaze pred neviđenim izazovom, barem kad se radi o zadnjih 30 godina, dakle od rata u postjugoslavenskom prostoru. Vanjske politike mnogih zemalja sada su u potpunosti ili u velikoj mjeri usredotočene na posljedice toga rata, koje će biti dugotrajne i velike, i za Rusiju, ali i za Zapad, i za cijeli globalni međunarodni poredak. Oni na Zapadnom Balkanu koji su preživjeli prethodni rat posebno teško podnose ovaj. Scene ratnih stradanja u mnogima su probudile osobne ratne traume. Probudile su i strahove od novog rata koji bi se mogao, premda se svi nadamo da neće, preliti iz Ukrajine u druga područja. Taj strah koji je sasvim razumljiv, potom se može lakše, lako zloupotrijebiti od strane onih koji su nezadovoljni rezultatima nekog prethodnog rata i priželjkuju novi. Kako spriječiti takav razvoj događaja? Treba li Zapadni Balkan bolje zaštititi od nekog eventualnog domino efekta ukrajinskih zbivanja? Treba li ga sada, kad većina Europljena više ne gleda na Balkan kao na neku imaginarnu granicu između Zapada i Istoka, nego su takvu granicu pomakli dalje prema istoku, na primjer u Ukrajinu, iskoristiti tu novu okolnost, pa Zapadni Balkan uključiti što prije u Europsku uniju i to cijeli Zapadni Balkan, bez izuzetaka. Kako spojiti geopolitički, realistički, sigurnosni pristup s liberalno-demokratskim pristupom? I je li to moguće? To su sve nova pitanja za svaku zemlju, a posebno za one koji sebe vide kao velike sile. Naša današnja konferencija, koju organiziramo u dva panela, od kojih je jedan više politički i diplomatski, a drugi više akademski, 
Trebala bi nam pomoći da bolje razumijemo neke od ovih pitanja, a naročito da razumijemo kako Velika Britanija gleda na njih. Forum za vanjsku politiku zahvalan je na suradnji koju smo i ovom prilikom ostvarili s Britanskim veleposlanstvom u Zagrebu. Ova konferencija, kao i prethodna tri događaja od rujna prošle godine do sada, ona je od 25. godišnjici sporazuma o normalizaciji odnose među Srbije i Hrvatske, drugi o politikama pomirenja u regiji i treći o nerazjašnjenim pitanjima nastalim dezintegracijom Jugoslavije, organizirana je uz pomoć public diplomacy granta kojeg je forum dobio za svoje aktivnosti u prethodnih šest mjeseci. Posebno mi je zadovoljstvo sada što mogu pozdraviti veleposlanika gospodina Sajmona Tomasa kojeg pozivam da nam se obrati pozdravnom riječju. Mr. Ambassador, please. Poštovani gošte, dragi prijatelji, drago mi je što smo se ukupili danas da razgovaramo o ovoj vrlo aktualnoj i važnoj teme. Posebno mi je drago također što je se Stuart Peach, posebni izaslanik britanskog premijera za Zapadni Balkan, došao u Hrvatsku kako bi s hrvatskim dužnosicima i ostalim političkim akterima, s vama, ekspertima, razmijenio razmišljanje o stanju na Balkanu i opasnostima koje ruska agresija na Ukrajinu može potencijalno izazvati i ovdje. Long before my arrival in Croatia, I learned never ever to suggest that Croatia is part of the Balkans. But one thing I do, one important thing I do here as ambassador is to talk to Croatians, and in particular the Croatian government, about the Western Balkans. You all know it really well. You're the region's closest neighbor. You're connected not only by a thousand kilometer border, but by deep connections, family links, business ties, a lot of history. And what happens in the region affects Croatia and what Croatia does affects the region. Those discussions, as Stan was saying, have rarely felt more important than they have in the last few weeks in the context of what's going on only 700 kilometers away in, in Ukraine. And so Stuart's visit feels particularly timely. And you've come, here, come to hear him rather than me talk about that aspect of things. But perhaps just allow me very briefly to make a link to the, the wider question at, at discussion this morning. And that's the question of Britain's role on the international stage after our exit from the European Union. Because I think what we're trying to do in Ukraine, where you've seen the UK fully engaged and at forefront of diplomatic efforts, driving sanctions against Russia, providing military and humanitarian support to Ukraine, working closely in tandem with our partners, allies and friends, and very much including Croatia, to show unity and condemnation of the Russian aggression and our unwavering support for Ukraine's sovereignty and integrity. What we're trying to do in the Western Balkans, where we're making a determined effort, again along with close friends and allies, to support the security and stability and prosperity of a region that's crucial to European security, to stand up for democratic values and norms that allow our societies and economies to thrive, and to stand up for those who seek destabilization Well, I think those examples tell you a lot more about what my Prime Minister means when he talks about global Britain than perhaps if I were to try here and attempt a, a theoretical definition. I think they also give a good sense of how important our shared agenda with Croatia is, why it really matters that we succeed in that agenda, and why we really need forums such as these, where we bring together policymakers and experts and other intelligent minds. And I'm very grateful to, to the Foreign Policy Forum for hosting us today, and I really look forward to the discussion. Hvala vam, Asvina. Uh, better now. Um, I would like to uh, wish you a warm welcome, Your Excellencies, friends and colleagues. Also, uh, welcome to all those who are following us uh, through social media. Uh, we have uh, an hour to uh, talk. We will finish a little bit earlier before uh, scheduled. And our plan is to ask our distinguished speakers to uh, give Um, their view on the situation in which we find ourselves now, because the Balkans 
have been uh, quite uh, regressing I would say in the last years and deserved additional attention of the international community. But now with the aggression on Ukraine, this region has received additional uh, attention due to potential further instability. Um, after we hear from our speakers, we will reserve some time for questions from you if you wish to ask and uh, therefore I would, like to, I would like to start, because we don't have much time, but we have plenty of topics to discuss. I'm particularly pleased to uh, welcome Sir Stuart Peach, who is a senior British military officer and held top positions in the British uh, military. He was also deployed to Kosovo and was the chairman of the NATO military committee. He is now envoy of the British Prime Minister to the Balkans, so Sir Peach, Please tell us what is your role, how do you see your role? Well, hello. hello everybody and uh, thank you to the Foreign Policy Forum for this opportunity. And on behalf of excellencies and distinguished guests, can I begin by expressing my thanks for this opportunity to speak. We sit here, I note many experienced people in the room and many young people in the room. We sit here in the middle of a war in our continent, and I am very conscious of the fact I am sitting in Zagreb, which is a capital that has known war in my lifetime, in our lifetime. And so the memories for you as the Croatian people and the people of the region are also disturbed by this illegal and aggressive war in Ukraine. And I understand that, and as a man who has served in conflict in many parts of the world, and therefore pray for peace, as most generals do, I understand how some of you must be feeling, and your families. And so we need to think that this is a very serious time for our continent and this region. And I agree with what have, has already been said. The region is not yet threatened by the war directly, but I worry that some of the political issues in the region could become security problems if we let them. Therefore, my first point is to make sure that we work together with governments, with civil society, with everyone in the region to make sure that this illegal war in Ukraine does not spread. It's a very serious point. And of course, this war is also revealing the naked reality of the Russian regime and the behavior of the Russian armed forces on the battlefield, which is not for the first time in their history, but it is very clear now to the Ukrainian people the nature of the threat they face. So it's serious, it's difficult, but also there are perhaps some region, reasons to put the political issues in this region in context. I would call it to zoom out, to zoom away from the very tactical and the very local important as that is. Because the region has been through a troubled time, and many of you know that better than me. The region has been through its own wars, as I've said. It's also been through many years of progress, as, as you've said. And we must not put that at risk. At the same time, we face a humanitarian challenge which we have not seen since the wars of the 90s. The, the sheer volume of Ukrainian people needing our compassion, our support, our help should also make us realize this is a new situation. And in new situations, we need to tackle some of our old problems in a new way. And across the region, there are bilateral disputes, there is unfinished business, there is room for normalization. I may be thinking perhaps of the Belgrade-Pristina dialogue facilitated by the European Union and supported by my government. So why now for me and why now for the UK and why now for this forum? My point was made, appointment was made before the war against Ukraine began and my role is as the special envoy for the Prime Minister Boris Johnson reporting to the Foreign Secretary to bring that sense of focus, to bring that sense of urgency 
and to bring that sense of Britain cares, the UK cares about the region and we can help where we can. We have strong embassies across the region in every country. We have great ambassadors. We have strong local teams supporting our embassies. We have a memory. We have a history. We have a continued presence in the military missions and the United Nations missions and the other international organizations in the region. But the most important message I want to give you is we care. And we care about giving a better hope for the young people of the region, the next generation, as well as helping as a good international actor and friend of the region to resolve some of the long-standing issues. And that's why I was appointed, and that's what I'm trying to do. I visited every capital in the, f in the first few weeks of my appointment. And I've spoken to every president, prime minister, foreign minister, defense minister, chief of defense, chief of police, and where appropriate, other ministers. I've engaged with the political opposition in all the countries, and I'm not shy or afraid of saying that, because we have to hear all the voices. I try when I can to engage with young people. I did it last night, and thank you, Professor, at the University of Zagreb. And where we can, we also are part of supporting civil society through the British Council and other ways. So we try and understand your views. We try and understand your fears, your concerns, and we'll try and work with you. And we are active in all that work. Many of the problems that are being dealt with in the region are not new. Many of them, indeed, you can trace back to the wars of the 90s and beyond, and I'm very conscious who is in the room. And so they're not new problems, but maybe they need energy and a fresh look. And of course, some are bilateral, and it's not for me as a British official to comment on them, but we can support by listening to both sides. It's important, for example, that we resolve, that the, the, the Bulgarian government and the North Macedonian government resolve their issues bilaterally. It's important that we, the British government, support the EU-facilitated dialogue between uh, Belgrade and Pristina. It's important that we continue, continue to support the democratic values, the rule of law, and human rights in the political evolution of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And it's important that we support democratic values and governments in Montenegro. I have also visited Albania. It's 100 years since the UK established diplomatic relations with Albania. We mark that this year, and it's an important anniversary. And Albania has been through many challenges. And Albania is part of the region. But Albania is also a NATO ally. What's my principal ambition? My principal ambition is to help you in the region achieve your aim of Euro-Atlantic succession, joining the European Union across the region. Croatia is already a member state. Croatia is already a NATO ally. But uh, the, the neighbors, your friends, your kin, your families across this region also need to have that opportunity. And now more than ever, they need that opportunity of the Euro-Atlantic journey. The success the Croatian people have experienced needs to be shared. And so we're committed to that. And some of you will say to me, I imagine I will get a question, how does what you've just said balance against the UK decision to leave the European Union? Well, we haven't left Europe. We haven't left the region, and we continue to work across this region for that journey. And I see nothing wrong with that. And of course, we will do that in different ways, in different countries, in different levels of preparation for that accession. But if I pick an opportunity now, it would be to say to all of us, to all of us, we need to work together across the region to achieve that ambition. Because it matters. You can see people make choices. I've been shocked, and I am the age I am, I cannot change that. I'm a grandfather. I have been shocked by the scenes of people fleeing Ukraine. And my own family, my own, the, the small town I live in, UK, we are busy organizing ourselves with charities as you are to support those people fleeing their country. 
And the, the, the wave of humanitarian support across Europe is, is incredible to see. The unity that has been achieved in the European Union meetings in Brussels is strong, and we support that. I would add, of course I would add, you would expect me to, the unity that is demonstrated through your membership as an ally in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is more important than ever. NATO provides collective security and defense through deterrence for one billion people. One billion people. And now more than ever, that is a solemn duty. Imagine a world in Europe without the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, where the defenses would be what they are, the arrangements would be where they are, local, and of course, you can see the ambition demonstrated by Russia. So the ability to provide collective security through the North Atlantic Treaty Organization as a military alliance underpinned by an elegantly written treaty, the Treaty of Washington from 1949, which I would argue is one of the best documents that came out of that period and has stood the test of time through Article 5 and the other articles. And of course, there's more to it than that. The confidence that the militaries, including the Croatian military, which I know well, this is not my first visit to Croatia. I respect your armed forces, I respect their capabilities, and they need to be developed along with other countries. I also respect the sovereign choice Croatia has made to help the people of Ukraine. But it's more than sovereign choices now. It is about that sense of collective security to deter further aggression from Europe and to avoid the spillover of this conflict. And in that sense, let's work together to get the European Union journey established. Let's work together to make sure this war does not spread. Let's work together to find ways to solve political problems locally, nationally, and regionally. And the British government commits to do that. My ministers, our ministers are very active. Our prime minister is traveling almost every day. Our defense minister is traveling almost every day. Our foreign secretary, my boss, is traveling almost every day. So Britain is committed to the security of your region and the partnership and friendship as an ally to Croatia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sir Peach. Uh, if I can follow up quickly before we move to other speakers, uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is you, visit, you said you visited all six countries in the Western Balkans and uh, each one has its own challenges. Um, do you see, if you were to trade the priority or somehow list them, where are the weakest spots? And um, we uh, heard yesterday the Russian ambassador in Bosnia-Herzegovina threatening that if the country moves towards the NATO uh, path, that it may face Ukrainian fate. How do you comment this? If I take the, the, the last question first, of course I saw the, uh, the statement made by the Russian ambassador. I must admit I thought it was an odd statement to make. And it's not diplomacy, because it was a threat. And that is not diplomacy in my experience. And we see the joined up nature of Russian activity across the region. We see attempts by Russia to influence through media ownership, through energy, let's be honest, through the ownership of energy, both in terms of supply and in the organization. And so it isn't just about the battlefield. This is a struggle. This is a narrative of support from Russia. As for the region itself, it would be quite wrong and appropriate of me even, if I may, <laughs> to rank uh, your local uh, and regional problems. What I would say is all of them, however long-standing, however difficult, I would use the word intractable, they may appear, there are always ways to find room to talk. Talking is better than war. And perhaps now there is an opportunity created to find the space to talk, to find the space to give a bit and take a bit where necessary, but give a bit in terms of 
understanding the other point of view. I've mentioned the Belgrade-Pristina dialogue. Of course, we are today, this day, this Friday, awaiting uh, news of electoral law reform in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And again, the British government and I call for the politicians in Bosnia and Herzegovina to return to the state institutions and, and develop the governance, the democracy, the rule of law and the human rights for your neighbor. We look for a successful outcome to the political difficulties in Montenegro. We look away, a long way from here to a successful outcome for the negotiations between North Macedonia and Bulgaria, which are going well, and that is good news. And beyond that, we look for sensible regional support and cooperation, which we receive through NATO and the solidarity through the European Union. But above all, in answer to your question, let's work together to get this European Union accession firmly established. Let's work together to, get, to make progress, to give that hope for the next generation, to avoid them becoming, frankly, in this time of war and conflict, to becoming fed up, upset, and therefore only too willing to leave your region, your beautiful countries, and the opportunities that lie for the future. So it's serious, but we need to provide that hope. Thank you. And I will underline what you said about the need uh, to approach negotiations with looking, seeing yourself in the other. I think this is very, very important and sometimes uh, too easily forgotten. Madame Pusic, um, uh, first let me introduce, uh, although I don't know, uh, um, Vesna Pusic need to be introduced to this audience, but she is former Deputy Prime Minister and the former Foreign Minister of Croatia, member of the Croatian Parliament, a writer, politician, and an active um, uh, member of Croatian political and public life, and also co-founder of the Foreign Policy Initiative. In light of everything that we have heard, and um, uh, speaking from Croatia, uh, how do you, uh, assess the present moment uh, and how do you um, see from the Croatian perspective uh, and Croatian position what are the main challenges for our foreign policy in the context of our neighborhood and now in the context of a broader war in Europe? Hello. Um, this is an exciting moment and I might have mentioned to some of you before that the, my favorite title of a book is a title of a book by Timothy Garden a British historian and all around public intellectual and the title is The Uses of Adversity and at the moment this region could be at the receiving end of actually finding something positive in the horrible all around and global circumstances that, that we are in uh, at the moment after Russian aggression uh, on, on Ukraine. But also a consi considerably smaller tragedy, but still a bad thing, in my opinion at least, and that, that was Brexit. Britain left the EU. I think that's bad for EU and it's bad for Britain and I hope it will return. But one good thing that came out of it, I think, is that Britain got more focused on our region. And Sir Stuart Peach is a, a case in point, a proof that, that Britain actually decided to take a more proactive approach to southeastern Europe or Balkans, Western Balkans. I, for myself, am proud that Croatia is part of the Balkans and Mediterranean and Central Europe and all of these different things, the more the merrier. Um, the other thing is the war in Ukraine, which is horrible and, and for us especially because we see Vukovar scenes every day in Mariupol, in Kharkiv, 
in all the, the uh, cities that are being obliterate, obliterated and, and bombed into smithereens. Which looks, which you know, not only brings memories, but actually we can unfortunately relate to probably more than, than most. However, I think that that horrible global and dangerous global event has created potentially, if we know how to use it, an opportunity for Southeast Europe or for the Western Balkan Six, so to speak. But the opportunity for Western Balkan Six is the opportunity for this entire part of Europe, because without security functioning states, uh, free societies in the Western Balkan Six, as I said, when we were joining the European Union, we are joining, but we are not moving. We are still here where we are, and it reflects to all of us, uh, on all of us in, in the region. Uh, why do I say that this has opened an opportunity for us, I mean for, for the region? I would say there are three indicators, reasons. One is that the destabilizers in the countries of the region who were used as Putin's pawns, which we all knew for, for a number of years, and uh, unfortunately, we didn't manage to, um, I would say, confront it effectively. But they got a little scared. They got a little scared because A, most of them have their money in Russia. B, because um, when they saw the effects of sanctions on Putin himself and on uh, Russia, they got a little bit worried about how that could look in their own case. So we saw in, for instance, Dodik's communication with uh, Minister Baerbock, Foreign Minister of Germany, that he was much, let's say, more forthcoming in asking about Bosnia-Herzegovina's joining the European Union and, and uh, discussing that whole issue. The other reason is that the war in Ukraine united Europe. This, was, this is also, I think, a sort of sad thing to say, that it took something so horrible. But for the last 10 years, um, there wasn't much unity in Europe. If anything, it was going in the op opposite direction. The war in Ukraine united Europe and focused Europe's mind in the sense of understanding that leaving unfinished business in the Western Balkans, which is European territory, and we can say whatever we want, but Western Balkans is consolidation of European territory. In some ways, it's not even enlargement. It's making sure that in this soft underbelly of Europe that's surrounded by European territory, uh, there is security to begin with, and then everything else. Because without that, um, it wouldn't have been the first time that Europe was, was disrupted, let's say, not to say destroyed, uh, by events starting in this part of Europe. And I think the war has sort of focused Europe's mind in that sense. And the third thing is that in this whole uh, period of, of reacting to the war, trying to deal in Ukraine and trying to deal with it, um, it became more visible who are the potential partners in these countries of the region. Because, as we all know, nobody can help you if you cannot at least a little bit help yourself. You have to have partners in the countries, in the, uh, the region, that can work with whoever wants to push forward you know, democratic institutions and, and uh, some stability and, and democracy in these countries. And there are people in these countries. Uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina is always our, our key concern because A, 
Croatia is over a thousand kilometers of border with Bosnia and Herzegovina. B, it has a spotty history of our own politics in Bosnia and Herzegovina over the past 30 years. So take some responsibility. And C, because it's probably the most sensitive, let's say, together with Montenegro, but probably the most sensitive uh, area of the, uh, of the region. I would say that today, because of all, all these things, the question is, unlike in the last 10 years, is not anymore, will the countries of Western Balkans join the European Union? It's how to define and secure that this process goes ahead. And I won't go into details because it would take too, too much time, but I just wanted to say that at the moment there are at least four models on the table, four ideas that have been developed of how that could be done. One was developed by um, the European Stabi Stability Initiative that says roughly let all the Western Balkan six join uh, the common market, the European common market, and we'll think of rule of law, judiciary, all the 35 chapters that we, were, we are so familiar with. Uh, we'll think about that later. That will be a positive sign and boost to the uh, countries of the region. And at the same time, it won't create so much um, resistance from the member states. The other model that's on the table was developed by Balkan in Europe Policy, Policy Advisory Group, or BIEPAG, um, that talks about four phases or four stages of um, accession for the countries of Western Balkans from a very uh, low level, let's say, first phase, minimal phase, where there are minimal requirements and small financial assistance uh, from the cohesion, European cohesion funds, goes through four stages. Every country goes through four stages. And the last stage is full membership with also full uh, financial uh, assistance. The third model is the one that has been tried in the European Union before, uh, when the f three Baltic states were joining, uh, the, the um, three Scandinavian member states, uh, Denmark, Sweden, and Finland, paired with uh, Denmark with Lithuania, uh, Sweden with Latvia, and uh, Finland with, with Estonia, and basically shepherded them through the whole process, sending know-how, sending their public servants, civil servants, uh, to transfer knowledge, to train people, to help them uh, with legislation, to help them with uh, adjusting the entire state apparatus, so to speak, to the new conditions. And to this day, the accession of these three, okay, <laughs> these three is considered probably the most successful access accession of Eastern European countries to the European Union. And the fourth is the, what we, the, the current model that's on the table at the Europe, in the European Union, what we could call the French model, or focusing on rule of law and uh, uh, judiciary as the key thing, and everything else uh, comes later. In my opinion, all four models are good. And something can be used from all of them. The question is, who is, go the, the approach now needs to be hands-on, because none of these models is going to work. If the European Union doesn't decide that it's their task or our task to actually implement that, helping these societies also to elect, you know, in democratic process, pro-European leaderships. All of these countries 
have already on the political scene, in their political elites, people who are genuinely pro-European. They might not necessarily be their presidents at the, time, at, at the moment, but they could. And uh, finally, one thing that, that was shown uh, or demonstrated with the war in Ukraine is that unfortunately, while Putin is head of at the helm of Russia, they're not partners in this business, which we thought they were for a long time. And I must say, I personally was very sad watching the Russian flag coming down at the Council of Europe. And I hope times will come where that will change. But for the moment, we have to be aware of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we are our time is slipping, uh, so I will uh, save my question for later. I will only um, underline what you said about seeking partners, maybe outside the elected officials or elected uh, uh, or leadership of these countries in a sense that the European Union reaches out to a broader society, uh, or, um, uh, social forces or political forces or new budding uh, um, democratic um, initiatives um, and that, if I understood you correctly, they need the support also in order to carry out reforms uh, in, um, in the Balkans. And my comment actually to the four models that you described um, and the combination of these is all fine, I think, in times of peace. But I think now, thinking about the enlargement, and not only of the Western Balkans, which we are discussing today, but Ukraine has its bid, and Georgia, and Moldova, and so on, I think the European Union has to decide whether it is primarily geopolitical uh, union, whether it cares about security, or it is only about economy. Because I think when the EU decides or identifies itself, I think it will be easier to make some uh, difficult uh, policy decisions and uh, times have changed, so I think we will have to adjust to them. Professor Gerdesic is a political scientist and a diplomat. He has thought for many years and still teaches, as we have heard, and was Croatian ambassador both to, the, uh, to Washington and in London. Uh, I would like to ask you, hearing everything what we have heard, um, to also give us Um, to give us um, also maybe transatlantic um, um, view uh, and, uh, and how do you see uh, the role of Britain after Brexit, of the UK, but then also through transatlantic cooperation and then their focus or their activities in our part of the world. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Your Excellencies, Sir Rich, my two uh, former, former friends, a former boss, Vesna. <laughs> former, I was going to say former boss and former colleague at the Department of, of Political Science. I was trying to uh, arrange my comments and thoughts in Croatian, so this early confusion comes from transitioning myself to, to English language. Uh, but I'm glad I'm here. It's uh, after the pandemic, uh, my basically first uh, live appearance. So I want to thank uh, the organizers for this invitation to join you in commenting on something that it's, it's been on my mind for a while. It is a hard act to follow after um, Sir Leach and, and, and uh, Vesna to, to continue this debate. So I will um, move a little bit more closely to the uh, post-Brexit, as you suggested, situation. Uh, when I heard that the referendum on, on Brexit passed, my first thought was, it's a bad news for enlargement. And I think it's been proven that it is a bad news for enlargement. 
Britain has always been a strong supporter of conditioned enlargement process. Uh, enlarge, be ready, and you will be accepted. There may be different reasons why UK was such a strong supporter of enlargement. It certainly benefited Croatia uh, in, in, in her pr process. Um, the reasons may be that uh, the more the merrier, the more small countries, the, the weaker the European Union, or better forms of alliances against France or Germany. So there may be different ideas why this is important, but of course the basic idea is that this is good for these countries, that this is good for the European Union and the Europe as a whole. So um, once Britain left the European Union, uh, it has, what has happened is that it lost its leverage on the West European candidate country through the enlargement process. We have heard efforts here to explain that Britain can stay committed to the region in many different ways, but the main uh, instrument of pressuring, guiding, helping, and achieving the EU membership is when you sit at the table and decide about the enlargement process of a country. And I think we have experienced that in a positive way with Britain. Now I think Britain uh, has to develop different forms of influence, once being out of the Brussels decision-making bodies. It may be uh, reaching to Commonwealth countries. Uh, sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it's just uh, nice memories. Reaching to India, uh, redeveloping special relations with United States. Uh, but what I think it's really important that Britain new, new and strengthened efforts in the multilateral organizations is important. The new initiatives in NATO, stronger position, stronger activities, EUN, and other international organizations is something that can, in a way, compensate that lack of influence by leaving the leaving, um, European Union. One thing that I was expecting and which happened is that one other way of compensation is strengthening bilateral relations. I think this is where we are now in, with the story about the Western Balkans. I think that UK has engaged more bilaterally than before to uh, fill that vacuum that, that has been lost by Brexit. Uh, and of course, this is um, especially in security area where um, Britain has been a strong provider of security and intelligence and other uh, important elements to European security. I think this is an asset that Europeans or European Union recognizes, and these countries of Western country, Balkan recognize too. Uh, we have seen that there was some uncertainty how to use that security capacity uh, when Boris Johnson was foreign minister, he pledged that Britain will be a strong contributor to European security. And I remember, sir, his line, we are leaving European Union, but we are not leaving Europe. Uh, we all sitting in front of him hold our breath that this will really be true. Then during the Brexit negotiations, that security issue or contribution has been dropped. Uh, and replaced for a while with the idea of clean Brexit or global Britain. And now we see the return of Britain back to the security issues of European Union, unfortunately because uh, of that Ukraine terrible, terrible war. Even we see foreign minister traveling to Brussels meetings again and re-engaging re in security issues with European Union. If we move closer to, to the topic, UK and, and the Western Balkans, I think that uh, Britain has shown, as I said, especially in bilateral and limited formats, its renewed interest in these countries. There was a summit of Prime Minister in London in 2018, 
Uh, there was a foreign minister summit in 2021 of the six countries and the British side, which was always, which is always a good, uh, good thing to have. Um, so I think uh, arguing and supporting these countries on their European enlargement path is still the, the British politics. As I said, it has been weakened because we, we heard arguments, why you, are you suggesting our membership in EU when you have left it? Can we learn from your Brexit something about our situation? Is it really necessary that we do that? And that, that argument is, well, unpleasant. Uh, but I think there are other arguments in saying why these countries have to do it and why Britain is sort of uh, uh, actor who will, who will support them on that, on that path. So what is needed in the Western Bal um, Balkans and in our Southeastern Europe region is fill the political vacuum, security vacuum, uh, economic situation by UK and European and American presence to, in a way, prevent further influences of Russia and China. Uh, Russia politically and in security way, China in economic way. Uh, China economic policy bring corruption and non-transparent non economic behavior. So things that uh, certainly these countries don't need. Uh, somebody said that Western Balkans is a great area of uh, importing instability and insecurity. And of course, there are actors willing and ready to do that. So I think the UK and European position here is complementary, supporting these countries in the rule of law, in fighting corruption, in educating young leaders and politicians in governance, in improving transparent governance in civil sector, everything that is needed and that is on European agenda. Uh, there is a, a House of Lords report on UK and Western Balkans published just before the summit in 2018 that is still valid. It has been four years, but everything that's written in the House of Lords report on our region is still very important, very nicely uh, argued, and uh, something that I relied, of course, um, heavily in my presentation. What we need today is exactly this. There is, as Vesna talked, there is a silver lining, even in the most terrible things, lessons that can be learned. The, the exposure of populist would-be autocratic leaders uh, all of those who undermine the future of its own nations. So I, I welcome uh, UK presence, political, economic, in civil society, in cultural affairs. And I, I would say I miss its strength in European Union decisions, but we are where we are and um, we have to move on and really keep Boris Johnson uh, for his word that he is not leaving European Union and sorry your presence here and, and ambassador's activities uh, show that uh, we are back on the right, right track. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very, very much. Um, as, uh, as you said, maybe the UK left the European Union, but not Europe. Vesna, you used to say that Croatia joined the European Union, but does not leave this region. Uh, so geography obviously uh, matters, and we need to adjust to change circumstances. So even, I think, discussion of the EU enlargement, as it used to be, is a now in a different context, and uh, I think we need to maybe more quickly adjust to, to um, our fast-changing uh, reality and seek on new opportunities rather than maybe regret past um, uh, missed opportunities. I, we have some time, uh, five to seven minutes for, que for questions, if you have any. Uh, please raise your hand. In the meantime, I would like to ask... Um, you, Sir Peach, uh, about the um, NATO presence in the Balkans 
and uh, we saw the ex or reinforcement of U4 mandate in Bosnia Herzegovina. Is there uh, are there any other plans for reinforcements, or how NATO is securing security in this region? Of course, there are two uh, two points to make quickly. The first is that the in the mission in Bosnia and Herzegovina, it is a combination of the European Union force and the NATO headquarters in Sarajevo under Berlin Plus. And that format may not be understood widely, but it is a format which enables cooperation between European Union and NATO. And I would argue strongly that now more than ever, that has to be cooperation and not competition. Mm -hmm. The second mission, of course, is the Kosovo force which is a United Nations mandate under 1244, and it is an important mission as a third element of security provision for a safe and secure environment. Both missions provide that safe and secure environment and also provide reassurance to the local communities that there is an international presence which backs up the political situation. Beyond that, of course, it is for NATO to comment, and I will not comment on NATO's affairs, but simply observe there are a number of activities in the region, whether they're exercises or assurance measures or presence missions, which will continue to provide that safety, security, and collective sense of security. So that's a reality, and I think it is reassuring, and we have been blessed by a succession of, of thoughtful commanders in those missions. And so they are part of the fabric of the region and should remain so. And they, of course, sit inside the public space with the Office of High Representative in uh, Sarajevo, and I would like to put on the record uh, at this open event that the UK, the United Government, continues to support the Office of the High Representative in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any questions? I don't uh, see them. Uh, Madame Pusic. Um, Sapich uh, mentioned the human tragedy in Ukraine and uh, the fact that we have um, millions of refugees in less than a month of a conflict. We, are, we entered the fourth week of the war and um, the longer it continues, more refugees we will see. How do you assess the Euro European solidarity or the uh, policy of open door to Ukraine uh, refugees? Do you see this um, to continue? How will it affect um, receiving states? And if you want, maybe assess it against the 2015 refugee crisis, which, as we know, was a cause for many populist uh, movements in, in Europe, and maybe <laughs> added to Brexit also. The Ukrainian or, or Putin's war in Ukraine has created, it seems, almost three million refugees in, in four million, three, four four million, three four million. million in three weeks, or four, four million in four weeks, um, which is more than, than uh, ever crossed the Aegean from Turkey and went this Balkan route in 2015 and 2016. Um, but Europe reacted completely differently. You could say it's because of racism, you could say it's because of uh, neighborhood, that Europe felt more responsible because these are immediate neighbors. You could say it's because they don't, these are people that in no way differ from the people in the, in the neighboring countries. Whatever the reason, in the case of Ukrainian refugees, the reaction was good of the European Union. Uh, unlike in the case of Syrian refugees, and then, as we know, in 2015, about 70% were Syrian and 30% were everything else. By the end of 2016, it was the other way around. So. Uh, even uh, the, the way people are calling them, they're all calling them refugees. There's nobody who's a migrant now. 
If you remember, Syrians were very often called by many uh, European populist leaders. They were called migrants. They couldn't even be called refugees in some in some some countries. So there is a difference. But the fact that there is a difference and that that absolutely can be characterized as unjust doesn't mean that we should criticize this response now. This response now was good and maybe should be remembered for, for future reference. Hopefully we will never have anything like that again. However, something that we remember from our own case, but it was our kin, so to speak, coming from Bosnia-Herzegovina into Croatia and also people from Eastern Croatia coming into Western Croatia, etc. Compassion has, unfortunately, a short shelf life. You have to find structural ways of responding to this, because if you leave it for too long to societies to simply absorb that, or for Poland to be the recipient of two million uh, people, it will create conflict, it will create frustration, it will create all kinds of problems. Not because people are you know, intrinsically bad, but because it's simply too hard for a society to deal with that in an unstructured way. And this is why I think that that's another topic, and I'm glad you raised it, because that's another topic, together with, with how to approach Western Balkans, how to approach the voting model in the European Union after enlargement, how to, the, the third issue is how to approach the uh, refugee policy and asylum, asylum policy in, in Europe. There has to be a serious thinking through, as we knew from seven years ago, the Dublin model, that, that was really, crazy to invoke the Dublin model in dealing with millions and millions of people that, that come in. So this is another, as I said, the reaction was good in this case. It need a fo needs a follow-up and it needs a rethinking on the level of European uh, Union. Absolutely, I think the sheer volume of people who will uh, move and um, um, the effects it will have on societies in the context of the conflict that is so close is um, uh, certainly, uh, I think, reaching every individual in, uh, on our continent, or at least certainly in our um, neighborhood. I see there are no questions. I would have many for our panelists. Uh, we have five more minutes, so I will ask um, last comments if you would like to make in the context of our discussion or any particular uh, uh, point uh, you want to um, leave with, uh, with our audience uh, today. Professor Gerdesic, do you have? Thank you. Maybe just to follow up on, on Vesna comment, when we compare this two refugee situation, the one from Syria war and one from Ukraine. Again, these are the lessons that now we can learn about, if I might say, hypocritical way of handling the first Syrian refugee way. A uh, lot, of, lot of racism, a lot of prejudice, a lot of talk about terrorists coming, uh, putting uh, wire, barbed wires on the borders uh, even on much lesser numbers, on much lesser pressure on European countries. Uh, I don't say that this is uh, something that was possible to be different. But what I'm saying is that now, looking at how European citizens in the first place reacted to Ukrainian refugees, we have to ask ourselves, have we changed? How deep are in our societies these prejudices that we are trying to get rid of? Not very successfully, I would say. And how can that, today countries that put out the barbed wires around their, their state borders justify what they have been doing? I think it is Ukrainian war in so many ways is a mirror 
in which we can, in the first glance, see our dark sides. I'm sorry I'm spoiling the mood here, but uh, it is something that worries me, that there is a need for tragedy like this, that we can reflect on our own failures, our own laziness, our own incompetency or stupidity. So um, let's wake up. Let's look at this mirror and find the best of us, not only the worst of us in it. Thank you. Thank you. This certainly wasn't a, a mood-spoiling uh, last comment, but um, it is indeed um, time to uh, well, think th take things more seriously. Uh, definitely, uh, Sir Peach, the last word is, um, our last minutes are yours. These are serious interventions from my colleagues, and I'm grateful for them. The, the, the point I want to make is I have many years of experience of watching crisis management. This time, I'd like to leave you with the thought that this is now a new situation, and it will not change back. Our world, will not, our world in Europe will not go back to the way it was exactly the same. And this could be a long-term change. And therefore, we need resilience. We need the young people in the audience, the young people watching this event, to join civil society, to join governments, and to listen carefully to the values that we are talking about today. Because we need that resilience. We need that unity that's been demonstrated in the last few weeks in the European Union and in NATO to be sustained. And sustaining resilience is hard work. And that's when the voices, the noises, the media landscape in your interesting region could well challenge that resilience. And so uh, I agree strongly with you, sir, that we need to stay the course here. We have to support those people who are flooding into our continent. We have to challenge Russia in international fora and follow through on the sanction regimes that have been set up bravely in the last few weeks. We then need to keep the deterrence value of our alliance, NATO, strong, alive. May need many governments, mine included, to reassess their priorities. And I must say this in this region, and I would like to close on this. If in the region we do not attack, and I mean the word attack, the energy situation that we're now in, the energy crisis will just get worse. We need modernization, we need cooperation, we need new methods to give people the energy they need for a better future. And I close on that on purpose, because if we don't do that, we are giving opportunity to Russia beyond the border, the terrible war we see in our continent in Ukraine. So it's, it's a hopeful message if we get on with it and sustain our effort. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, please uh, join me in thanking our excellent speakers. I think we have opened many questions. I thank you for your frankness and um, you know, also emotional and quite straightforward and um, uh, strategic, I would say, uh, also some of the messages in order to make us, you know, wake up, as we heard, in order to uh, grasp the reality in which we are in, because luckily we are sitting here peacefully under these chandeliers. It's shining outside. There will be coffee served outside. And some people are not far away from here are experiencing completely different reality. And this is something that we unfortunately know too well, at least us who are older generations, but we do hope that first it will stop there soon and that human suffering will stop, but uh, secondly also that it will not spread because if it does just a little leave the territory of Ukraine, I think we will then have a completely different reality and this is something that nobody would want to wish. So thank you for your speeches and interventions.